This FedGov Today program is sponsored by ServiceNow and Kerasoft. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, an easier pathway to hiring CX pros for your agency from the Office of Management and Budget, the AI experience that's starting to reach the front lines of the federal government, and driving acquisition excellence all around the world through the State Department. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. Federal agencies are getting some help in hiring customer experience personnel. It's part of the latest update to the president's management agenda from OMB. Lauren DeYoung Schulman is associate director for performance and personnel management there. Lauren, welcome. It's great to see you great again. Great to be back. Thank you very much for coming in. How is it going to be easier for agencies to get these CX people that they need really badly? So let's talk about for a second. The whole objective of this initiative is the Biden Harris administration priority to build a government that delivers and works for all Americans. Talent is absolutely critical to unlocking that. And before we talk about where we are now, let's talk about how far we've come. Five years ago, if you asked agencies that deliver services to Americans, like healthcare, veterans benefits, or taxes, do you have the talent you need to actually listen to the customer and design services for them? They'd say, no, we have not nearly enough or zero. Today, over half of the, what we call high impact service providers have teams of customer experience strategists, of user experience designers and data analysts who have the expertise and the authority, importantly, to listen to the customer and put their voice first when they're designing. Mm -hmm. So we've done this through a couple of innovative ways over the past few years. One is a new, really great authority called pooled hiring, wherein as opposed to hiring just one person at a time, you make customer experience talent, for example, a government wide priority and you hire 50 folks at a time who can go work at any agency. We're doing that again over the course of the next year as part of supporting President Biden's 2024 budget which prioritized hiring 120 customer experience specialists. We did 50 a few years ago, we're going to go to 120 over the course of the next year, and this will make it so much easier for government agencies to get the talent they need. What's your sense of what the, the government-wide bandwidth is that's required? 120 on top of 50 sounds like a lot of folks, but then when you think about 2.1 million feds, it's a small piece of that. Absolutely. So just to be clear, there's lots of folks who are working on services across agencies. However, what these unique, uniquely talented individuals are doing are focusing on that listening, measuring, monitoring, building trust. So all the services we do today are actually enhanced. And with those objectives of building better, more seamless and secure services, the better we get, the more talent we need in order to support those objectives. I would say probably half of agencies today would say we need more. And my guess is it'll be the same number in a few more, a few more years. Because as, as they get more and they get stronger and better, they'll see a need and a desire for more of that expert talent to help them design services that deliver for Americans. And that need and desire, it strikes me, is part of the issue as well. Because I think if you went around and asked agencies five years ago, mm -hmm. Do you need a lot of customer experience people? The answer might not have been yes at that point. They might not have known what the possibilities mm -hmm. were in terms of listening to customers and using them to identify what some of the challenges are with services and elevating those voices from the design experience, the execution, and the, uh, the improvement process to actually make these deliver what Americans need. I read at performance.gov, we'll put a link to this at fedgovtoday.com, 26 of 35 high impact service providers across government are now publicly reporting data on their interactions with the public to increase accountability. What does that mean for the service providers and what does that mean in service delivery to the citizen, Lauren? So let's talk about why we're doing this. Two big reasons is what you said, accountability and transparency. There are very few places where we're collecting experience data, how you or I experience getting a tax refund or signing up for veterans benefits. We wanna bring all of those together to tell that story collectively to help us improve and incentivize us to improve. The other reason we're doing that is for agencies to learn from one another. So agencies that are delivering similar services can say, hey, the IRS is doing incredible work on call centers. How can we learn from them and improve? Or, hey, I see that this agency over here is getting amazing trust scores. How can we learn from one another? So being able to share this data incentivizes that learning culture that delivers for Americans and continues to improve on the services we deliver every day. How do you determine that the data that you're getting is actionable, mm -hmm. is clean, and that then it's 
worth making these decisions on that are very important to the way you provide these services? So it's a great question. So I think what we should not be doing is measuring things like how well did that call go mm. or how was that website experience? Instead, new guidance has come out in the last few months that instead tells agencies to measure outcomes. Did you get the service you expected at the timeline you needed it and without too much problem? And how can we ask questions about that in a way that is streamlined for Americans? So we're trying to move the questions we ask Americans from that transactional, was this a good moment for you, to is this actually resulting in the outcomes that you want and that we want for you? So we're the guidance we issued tried to measure that, uh, those change those surveys from is this moment working for you to is this service working for you is this experience working for you and is that building trust in government in a way that we anticipate uh, the life experiences projects are a big part of this yeah. give me a quick uh, refresher on what those are you started with five you're up to 11 now i believe so we've got five life experience initiatives with 11 projects that we're doing with that. So a quick primer on what life experience projects are. What we identified last year, uh, five different major life events that millions of Americans experience every year. Retirement, birth of a child, facing a disaster. These are things where you might have to access three or four different government services, different agencies, different application processes with different eligibility requirements. That is stressful, it is confusing, and it's probably coming at the worst time in your life. Life experience projects are about bringing those together to make it a seamless experience for you. Where as President Biden says, you don't have to know what, how to know. We do that for you on the back end in government so that we have projects that are making it easier to share data across government agencies that are building si single software platforms where a veteran can sign up for a dozen benefits programs through one application as opposed to doing dozens of applications that all have different requirements. The work we're doing in that space is transformative, it's systemic, and it should make a difference in terms of how Americans see government of not just this bureaucracy, this bureaucracy, but my needs are getting filled and it doesn't matter what agency was doing it. As you personally have gotten into that life experience project work, mm -hmm. Lauren, what have you seen regarding how much of that is business process re-engineering, how much of it is cultural agency to agency where it's a cross-agency thing, and how much of it is just the technology making sure the tech works? So you've hit upon it. It is all of the above. So much of it is helping us understand what it is customers are experiencing when they're going through these moments and not caring about it from a single agency or signal program perspective, but from that moment where they are experiencing that stress and vulnerability. And when they go to a website, does it tell them all they need to know for all programs, not just one? When they meet, when they speak to a customer service representative, is that the customer service representative uh, empathetic to the situation they're going through and recommending other programs to them or just focus on their objective? It is technology, it is culture, it is talent, it is data, and we're touching all of those efforts in our life experience projects, whether through veterans, or, early, or retirement or early childhood. What are the roadblocks, what are the pain points that you've experienced and your teams have experienced in trying to make that work? Uh, so one, uh, I will say one big one is not enthusiasm. There's a ton of enthusiasm for this work. We have incredible partners at states, across agencies, uh, and, and in the American public. I think some of the barriers are frankly just bringing together the tremendous insight that we already have around customers and making sure that the things that we are hearing actually go into service design, actually to go to improvements and go back into what we are communicating to customers overall. I imagine it's impossible to put a, a definitive timeline on all of these things, but how will you measure progress moving forward broadly across all of these areas yep. to make sure you're pushing in the right direction. This is one of the things I love about this work. Uh, we are actually talking about all of these projects every month, every quarter, and talking about not only our milestones and goals, but how well we're succeeding at them and where we're struggling, and trying to be transparent about our efforts and where we need help, and also where we're actually having some wins so people can learn from us. Performance.gov slash CX tells all of this story, and I can't wait to tell you more about it later. We'll look forward to having you come back and do that, Lauren. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks very much. You can find a link to all the material that Lauren talked about at fedgovtoday.com. Up next, the AI experience that's starting to reach the front lines of the federal government. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment.
the newest Innovation in Government TV show is coming. Innovation in Government Fed Ramp, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and on the FedGov Today YouTube channel. Recorded on location at Karasoff's Fed Ramp Headliner Summit, you'll learn how the program's doing in fulfilling the vision of its creators, building a platform to secure the cloud for the federal government. Innovation in Government Fed Ramp, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30. Learn more now at fedgovtoday.com. Welcome back. The Department of Veterans Affairs is showing its health care providers all over the country the potential of artificial intelligence. It's doing it, though, differently than you might expect. Jonathan Album is federal CTO and principal digital strategist at ServiceNow. He's former chief information officer at the Department of Agriculture. Jonathan, welcome. It's great to see you again. VA is doing things similar to what you and I have talked about in the past. They're calling their concept trustworthy AI, the way that they're trying to demonstrate to both their care providers and their end users, their, their, uh, their clients, what the AI will do for them. And the second thing they're doing is they're going to those care providers and they're saying, what do you do a lot of that you would like to do less of? And what are you not doing enough of to provide service uh, to your patients? Is that what you're seeing other yeah, agencies that, that, doing that across country? That definitely government? tracks with what I'm, what I'm seeing and hearing. You know, these, um, these generative AI technologies that are built on large language models have some uh, risk around data privacy and, and uh, reliability. When you, when you look at these commercially available technologies, chat, GBT, open AI, these, these things have tremendous value, but if you play with them and you can see the results that come back, uh, you might question them. And you know, if you can't trust the result, how can you apply that in a government setting where you're trying to serve, uh, serve the public? So you know, what I think will occur over time is that these, these technologies will make it into government, but they're gonna be based on smaller large language models and mm -hmm. these these smaller large language models you know will be built on maybe industry specific data or agency specific data or data from a technology provider that has lots of information about how technology is used and what makes it effective and we can use AI tools on on top of those data sets and those results will likely be a lot more trustworthy mm -hmm. reliable and if you know organizations create these large language models responsibly then they can be audited and people can have the transparency that makes this technology something that uh, can be trusted and, and, and used in a, in a setting, again, where you're, you're providing a critical service to, to a member of the public. Will agencies need to have different specialized tools to go with specialized data, or will they be able to use the tools that people are using more broadly? Um, ideally, they're going to be able to use the tools that they have and have those, uh, those data sets feed into them. I mean, when you look at technology platforms that are out there, many of these technology platforms have had AI built into it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And whether it's around predictive intelligence or some kind of document intelligence, these tools have been leveraging AI capabilities in federal space today. I think what's different is, um, uh, some, again, something like ChatGBT is, is sort of like Netscape in the early days of the internet. The internet was around, but Netscape made it accessible. ChatGPT makes generative AI accessible, so people now can start thinking about how to apply it. So the trick is to be able to use it within your existing technology construct so, the val so you get more value from these investments you've already made. And I, I, I have a high level of confidence that's the way that these tools um, provide real value in agencies and you know make it into day-to-day -day use cases. I like the Netscape analogy for the way that the, the potential exists to harness the technology mm -hmm. and make it accessible to people on an everyday yeah. basis. What lessons can we learn from that technology progression, the browser explosion that allowed people to access the internet compared to what we're seeing? Because it, I think you're exactly right. The, that's what happened with generative AI. Well, well I, I think it goes, um, I, I'd say there's, there's something in what you, you led with earlier with about the VA asking users what they need mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking, okay, now we have this technology, I'm just gonna deploy it and it's gonna solve our problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always more complicated than you have technology. Well, what are you trying to accomplish? So the fact that the VA is asking those questions, I think, is um, a healthy sign that they can be successful adopting these technologies. It goes back to, you know, what is the data that you have in your organization? How does that data flow through the organization? What are the processes you, you rely on? And ideally, agencies have spent a lot of time digitizing processes today. And you know we add AI technology on top of that, and you take the data 
that you know you take these processes these workflows that are um, that are that are digitized and providing real value and then you you know you elevate them using generative AI technology to make them more effective and make people more productive less than a minute left what are the next steps after finding out what employees tell you they do too much of and don't do enough of what do you do after that Jonathan well I think we have to have conversations with both employees we have to have conversations with our customers and their agencies to explain that these technologies are going to be used because there's a lot of fear out there there's a lot of questions people are are skeptical about you know um, AI and its long-term utility so if we can have the right kind of dialogue and we can get people on the same page about the things AI will do to provide value to make somebody more effective to make a citizen get the service they want faster a federal employee be able to serve that person faster or the agency to operate more effectively and the technologies are providing value to taxpayers, I think we're set up to be successful long-term as a, as a federal IT community. Jonathan Album, great to see you as always, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. You can learn more about the VA's approach to AI at fedgovtoday.com, and next week's FedGov Today podcast will feature leaders from VA telling you how they're taking that approach to AI. You can listen to those shows at fedgovtoday.com or anywhere you get your podcasts. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. The newest Innovation in Government TV show is coming. Innovation in Government FedRAMP, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and on the FedGov Today YouTube channel. Recorded on location at Kerasoff's FedRAMP Headliner Summit, you'll learn how the program's doing in fulfilling the vision of its creators, building a platform to secure the cloud for the federal government. Innovation in Government FedRAMP, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30. Learn more now at FedGovToday.com. Welcome back. 150 contracting officers around the world will get extra training in supply chain risk management. That extra training will focus on the cyber supply chain. Michael Darios is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Acquisition and Senior Procurement Executive at the State Department. Mike, welcome. It's good to see you again. What will these 150 COs get uh, training-wise, and how will they use it in their jobs at State? Well, Francis, we're, we're really leaning in on uh, cybersecurity at the State Department. We're one of the most targeted departments in the federal government, and we're taking the executive orders coming out of the White House very serious. Uh, this training is designed to really elevate the understanding and awareness of what cybersecurity means. Uh, especially in the procurement space. So we've introduced a, an interim policy uh, in anticipation of uh, something more formal coming out uh, and, and trying to educate contracting officers about uh, SBOMs, software bills of material, uh, explaining to them what the attestation process uh, is going to uh, entail, uh, and then also preparing them to evaluate proposals uh, that are going to come in with this information uh, so that we can make educated decisions about companies cyber plans. How much of what they're learning is uh, will, will be things that they have to start doing differently and how much of it is just awareness that as you're considering a, evaluating a proposal you should evaluate these points? Yeah there are definitely some some new processes uh, at play here. Um, we, we've not collected SBOMs previously. We, we certainly haven't uh, looked at uh, you know the the quality of those things and so that's going to be something different that's going to require collaboration between contracting officers and our, our ECISO uh, Donna Bennett um, it's going to require some collaboration with our, our customers uh, to really think differently about how we're evaluating the proposals and what we're collecting and asking for uh, in the RFPs. What's the state of your workforce overall? This is, I imagine, just a small piece of the uh, amount of uh, acquisition professionals that you have at the State Department. How big are you and what is the, the health of them? Are you getting the people that you need, the talent that you need to be able to continue to do the work? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So we've got about 350 folks uh, that support domestic uh, procurement. Uh, but then we have an entire workforce overseas, uh, about a thousand folks that uh, consist of foreign service officers, uh, but also locally employed staff that do procurement. So it's, it's a pretty big enterprise. Uh, we're, we're really focusing on growing that, uh, that workforce, uh, certifying them differently, um, focusing on uh, their workforce needs or development needs. Uh, so we're, we're trying to think uniquely about uh, the Foreign Service and how they do procurement overseas uh, and how to grow that 
uh, that workforce, uh, how to grow the, the, the LE staff uh, mm -hmm. overseas, uh, and then also domestically, uh, we're, we're introducing something called the Hire to Retire program out of my shop. So it's a, it's a holistic view of uh, of acquisition professionals from the time that we are recruiting them mm -hmm. uh, to the time that we bring them on board, how do we develop them, then how do we retain them, how do we keep them uh, staying at the department because every federal agency is kind of fishing in the same pond for mm -hmm. talent. Uh, you said uh, certifying the overseas uh, acquisition workforce differently, differently than the domestic workforce, or differently than you are now, or maybe some combination of both. Uh, diff definitely differently than than uh, the domestic uh, workforce. So foreign service officers have uh, limited warrants uh, overseas, uh, but we want them to be to get the same level of training uh, and 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 be eligible for a FACC uh, level one certification like our domestic contracting officers. Mm -hmm. uh, LA staff are very different. Um, um, they're usually not American citizens, and, uh, and so they, they can't hold warrants, but they are the unsung heroes out there at, at the embassies and the posts, uh, doing a lot of uh, really good procurement work. And so we want to do some things to try to develop them as well. And so we're introducing a unique certification uh, process specifically for our LE staff. Uh, what will that entail and what will they have to do in order to get that certification, Mike? Yeah, so it's, it's unique uh, training offerings that are specific to, uh, to their environment. Um, our policy director is, is really shaping the program now. Uh, we're, we're starting to get back into uh, some in-person uh, uh, trainings overseas for LE staff, but it's, it's really going to be a, a combination of um, uh, uh, new training that, that has yet to be developed, uh, but that is slightly different than what they might go through uh, if they were a domestic contracting officer going through that, that FACC certification uh, channel. One of the initiatives that's really impacting your overseas personnel is the Tech for Life initiative that's coming out of the CIO shop. Kelly Fletcher was on the show a while back, talked about that. What's the acquisition piece of that look like since a lot of that, I imagine, will be coming through you now in Washington rather than in the outposts around the world? Yeah, so I, let me start by saying I love Kelly's vision for, for Tech for Life. Uh, you know, her focus on enhancing the user experience uh, and what that's going to do for, uh, for the department uh, in general, just in terms of uh, mobility and the ability to, to, uh, to get to work faster. I just I, I com completely applaud that vision. Uh, we are supporting that in a variety of ways. Uh, so we're doing two very large uh, procurements uh, in, in the coming, well, one has yet to be uh, um, issued. One is currently underway. I'll talk to that one as well. Uh, so there's the access procurement, uh, which is going to be uh, a new agency catalog uh, for hardware. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to be putting that uh, RFP out there and putting a new agency catalog in place that uh, will give her a suite of uh, contractors to provision uh, the hardware. The hardware is a huge part of the, the Tech for Life uh, vision. And then I think the other uh, component to that is the Evolve acquisition. So uh, we are working very hard uh, to move through the phase one evaluations. Um, I'm pretty confident uh, that, that we'll be uh, issuing all of the, the, the advisory down select letters in the coming weeks and then we'll move into the phase two. And it sounds like that's about all you can tell me about Evolve right that's now, That's about Mike. right, yes. All right, fair enough. Um, with the access uh, acquisition, that sounds like uh, the, the goal is just to give people a pretty easy one-stop shop to be able to buy whatever they need. Is that what that's that, going to look like? That's exactly what it is, yeah. I mean, that, that contract is really going to be uh, underpinning everything that IRM is, is doing with uh, Tech for Life. Um, and, and it is, it's just that. It's a standard catalog that IRM will buy against, but also all of the other offices uh, that have IT budgets and do their own IT procurement, they'll be able to use that vehicle as well. You've also talked about kind of a reorg, a rethinking of the way that your office it operates, the way you do business. What does that look like and how do you keep that from being just a move the boxes around exercise yeah. to really changing the way that your organization does business, streamlining the way you do business? I, I'm excited about, about this one. I'm passionate about what we're doing here. So we're, we're trying to realign the organization to be more in line with uh, category management. Mm -hmm. We have a very large portfolio at the State Department, um, and, and, and I'll say that we are also plussing up in terms of our, our numbers. Uh, we're trying to catch up to the demand signal, so we, uh, we need to grow our acquisition workforce, number one, uh, in terms of size. Uh, but then we're trying to restructure it so that 
uh, for example, um, our IRM organization, um, IT, right, and cyber. We want a group that is focused specifically on buying IT and cyber for the department. And uh, the same will be for professional services, the same for uh, overseas uh, construction and infrastructure projects. Uh, and then diplomatic security is already a very unique portfolio. So we're going to re really restructure around that concept of looking at the commonalities, looking at where there's opportunity to aggregate demand so that we can buy smarter for the department. You may not want to give your secrets away to the other agencies that are watching this show, but where are you finding good talent? Where are you going to get the people that you want to bring in to do all these things? I, another great question. So uh, a, a big component of our Hire to Retire program that we've built is starting to socialize the concept of working for the federal government, number one, as, as a career choice, but then, hey, there's this very interesting thing called federal acquisition and mm -hmm. procurement. Let me talk to you about it. So we're, we're starting to form relationships with organizations uh, that give us access to talent pools outside of the typical USA jobs, right? So we're, we're getting into college campuses. We're getting into uh, uh, affinity groups that are, are business oriented uh, and might be able to uh, give us the platform to talk about our message. So we're trying to really, you know, frankly, shore up the entry level uh, through, through, through some of those means. And then uh, we're trying to do unique things to attract those, those mid-level and senior folks that are already in the government. Uh, over the summer, we, we did a, a really cool thing where we, we did a uh, meet State Department day. It was a virtual event. Uh, we, we had all of our senior managers in the acquisition organization uh, on camera and uh, talking about their respective portfolios, why they love the mission at the State Department. Um, and we are uh, actually, as a result of that, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, going to be onboarding about 40 to 45 folks in the coming months. It's great to talk to you, Mike. Thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate you. your time. You can read more about all the items Mike and I talked about at FedGovToday.com. FedGovToday with Francis Rose is back in a moment. The newest Innovation in Government TV show is coming. Innovation in Government FedRAM, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and on the FedGov Today YouTube channel. Recorded on location at Kerasoft's FedRAMP Headliner Summit, you'll learn how the program's doing in fulfilling the vision of its creators, building a platform to secure the cloud for the federal government. Innovation in Government FedRAMP, Tuesday, June 19th at 8.30. Learn more now at FedGovToday.com. Welcome back in today's event spotlight, GAIN 2023, the premier government marketing conference is coming October 17th. It's going to be at the Ritz-Carlton in Tyson's Corner, Government Marketing University's GAIN conference will host the leading minds in marketing to the federal government. I will see you there early that morning to kick off the conference. It's October 17th, and you can find a link to read more about it and register on the events page at fedgovtoday.com. FedGov Today is back next Sunday morning at 10.30. The director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Frank Whitworth, will be here. Dorothy Aronson has a new job at the National Science Foundation, and she'll tell you about it. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks very much for watching. See you next Sunday. Have a great week.